Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Behind Closed Doors Twelfth Night. Uh, my name is Will Tosh, Research Fellow and Lecturer at The Globe, and you will recognise Michelle Terry, Artistic Director and Viola uh, in Sean Holmes's Twelfth Night. Michelle, thank you so much for being here, especially after last night when you were on, and I know you're on this week as well. How are you feeling? I mean, it's amazing to be back in the building. It's amazing to get, you know, like, like all of us, just to get back to what we love doing. But there is something very particular at this time about being able to sort of hear the call over the tannoy saying this is your five minute call and just know that, that for the next two and a half hours, you're just going to be in this world and you're going to be with this group of people uh, focused on this world for a bit and forget life beyond. So, yeah, it's it's and amazing. I, and I'm and I'm very slightly envious to hear you describe that because, of course, those of us who work with you, but we're not we're not actors. We don't those, those magical hours on stage we, we don't have and, and, and viewers. Uh, to this are going to see that we're, we're on zoom and they might be able to yeah. tell that you're you're in, in 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 the office at the globe i'm i'm at home today i've been in you've been working at home as well but we're still yeah. in this kind of slightly weird mixed economy where we are kind of back but it's certainly not back to normal and yeah. we're still kind of slightly treading treading on eggshells a little bit about how we kind of wrap what you know, all the things that the globe does back into its package and yeah. its skin you know and, 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 and how we allow the building to hold all of that again is still I suppose a little bit challenging. It is and I think that's that's where we all are isn't it I think there's the sort of practicalities of we're slightly moving out of that we can get back on site now how we get back on site is a different question you know we know that the world has opened up and we know all about you know things that are in place to make that possible but I think there's also another question which probably would sort of feed into the 12th night conversation about where we are mentally like it's all very well saying great we can go back and watch a play or we can get back into the office but actually we've been through something and continued to go through something so seismic that had the ricochet of that I think we're really starting to to see now so there's just some people that really are not ready to get back on a train or get back into the theatre and I think something about one of the well, very few joys of the time is things like this that it, you know, or the live stream or whatever it is that if we're still not ready or not able to get back physically that we have other options um because yeah i think we're we're really feeling the consequence of this time now yeah. and i was thinking about 12th night as uh, as one of the sort of three um pillars of the the summer season along with the tour and, and, and metamorphosis mm -hmm. in, in inside and we've had romeo and juliet which is a tragedy and and it's a and it's a production that really leans in to the tragic elements of, of mm. that play we've had midsummer night's dream which certainly is not a tragedy mm. and is a very joyous comedy but i think even with midsummer you know that the first show coming back after after the pandemic after the lockdown had these sorts of elements of um of, of, of sort of flashes of kind of pain in it i yeah. think and I, I i saw twelfth night last night and it's such a cliche to say that Twelfth Night is a sort of, you know, sort of, you know, tragic comedy or it's kind of a sort of kind of, you know, comedy with shot through with sadness and all the rest of it. But of course it is. And I, I was I was really struck thinking about your your journey as Viola that and I'm going I'm just going to accept that our viewers have have, have seen it or are going to have seen the live stream. And we're yeah. going to have to we're going to have to talk about things that happen on stage. We can't yeah. we can't help yeah. it. So if you haven't seen it, pause this now, watch the live stream and then come <laughs> back and, and, and carry on. But your your journey is Viola. You, you, your, your first entrance is an entrance of grief, mm. as, as of, of loss. And that's incredibly clear in, in your performance. And it's not a completely happy journey for Viola. It's a very confusing journey mm. and you're the culmination you know you're that, that act five moment of, of resolution is one of great kind of happy sad but you know there is definite pain there and I think I saw more of that though those flashes of sadness in in Twelfth Night than I have before has that was that something that was conscious as you were as you were working on it or I think it's an, an element of, of where we are in, in 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 life and culture yeah I think I think it's conscious to the extent that it's in the play. I don't think that we've, I think we've explored the play. I think we've, we've sort of, uh, as you say, it begins, yes, it begins with Orsino talking about love, but he's talking about the love of someone that very quickly you learn is in mourning. The next person you meet has lost their brother. The next person you meet in comes Belch and they just lost their brother. And so you, you have a sequence of, of scenes of people 
either talking about someone in grief or actually seeing someone in a state of loss or a state of grief. So I think there was, it's conscious to the extent that that is what the play is dealing with. And, um, but I think the, the difference now probably is that the audience are also in a similar place to the characters. And that's really explicit when you talk about Romeo and Juliet, because we know this is a play written in a time of plague, plague happens in the play, suddenly, I know we've talked before about, so rarely do you get worlds in Shakespeare plays where the audience are in the same world as the characters. But I think that at, certainly at this pocket of time, everybody has got their version of what grief means um, and what sadness means and what loss means. So I think your, where the play is also meeting the time and meeting the audience at that time, I think it becomes even, even more heightened and conscious that that's what Shakespeare is, it, it, or, or certainly that's the place the plays start from. And then we know that, you know, love's labour's lost, we know ends with the inevitability of the death of the dad, but these shards of melancholy always cut through. And I think with, with um, Twelfth Night, that's, it, it seems to be what motivates people to into action. And I've been reading about tragedy recently and sort of like, you know, I know in, in, when we were exploring the plays, sort of going, well, all the questions around why does Viola turn into a boy or why, and there's a, a million reasons about, you, you can have lots of sort, of sort of intellectual reasons, but there's no meaning to it. It's just somebody in a tragic situation that has to put themselves into action. And I think sort of, it's just, it's been sort of fascinating to me as we as the as we keep doing the play it's all people in action for good or bad people are motivated by grief in order to then what what do i do now and i think that's that, that's the second thing viola says is what country friends is this well, what shall i do in illyria it's action what can i do now because the will to survive is is the first thing on her on her mind so yeah how do you survive grief how do you survive loss how do you survive this time um so yeah, that was all in there. And on a sort of much more practical, um, from a much more practical perspective, your experience of working on the show has also kind of surfed a certain kind of COVID wave, hasn't it? Yeah. So in the sense that you start, you know, it's the, it's, it's the Midsummer Company, which, which you're joining. So they've been on a particular <clears throat> a journey back into yeah. um, um, live performance. But even Twelfth Night, you know, you started rehearsals under certain conditions. Yeah. You opened the show under certain conditions. The show is now being performed under slightly different conditions. And, and sort of week on week, we're getting a few more people back into the building, yeah. uh, into the auditorium. So how does that, how does that sort of, that sort of swell or that kind of changing climate um, affect the way that, that you guys have been working as a company? Yeah, I mean, so I sort of start at the beginning, we were very much creating in a very rigidly socially distanced COVID world. That's the the, 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 the context that the Midsummer Night's Dream had also been creating in. So um, the way that the, the Globe's policy has been operating is essentially we're all in our own bubble. So you have to sort of act like you've got it and act like you could pass it on, which means that then everybody in the company is protected. If someone gets it, not everybody else then has to, you know, um, go into isolation. So that was sort of a kind of practical contingency about how do we keep going. But of course, that means you have to build distance into the shows. And some of the shows lend themselves to that more than others. We know the, the sort of proxemics of the globe space. You need distance anyway, really, because it doesn't really welcome too much kind of close contact. Um, but that was that was absolutely built into the DNA of Twelfth Night. And it was and we opened in those conditions. We opened to a socially distanced house at 400 people. As you say, that's kind of um, eased as time has gone on. And, and we had a, a holiday week last week and then came back to over a thousand people. And you just realize that that's what these shows are built for, that they are built to, um, and, and you, you, when we were um, off, uh, not just before we met on this call, you were talking about the speed of thought in the play and the dexterity of the speed of thought, that that is what that energy of that space gives you. That is what those groundings give you because often they're ahead of you. They will reveal things to you about the play that you or, or about this production that you had no idea because they're so far ahead. Um, and that's what suddenly having a thousand uh, brains all working at speed just gives an energy and a swell to these plays that they're, that that's what they're built on. And 
and and also that these are plays built for conversation like you, and, and in Twelfth Night you realise just how many people are in dialogue trying to either ally the audience, be with the audience, recruit the audience, there's such a character to all of the people in these plays. Um, so having more it, it just just makes sense of, of it all but it is interesting kind of having time to go actually what would this production have been if we could have made contact and when I think about the the relationships which it, and it is but it's like you, you saw it last night so where are we now the 3rd of September you know with the, the things that are easing so it's not a contact less production like we're being very safe about how we make contact um, but there are absolutely moments of touch that I think just speak louder now because we haven't been able to to, to touch um, and certainly in with the, the relationship with the lovers, like what does the gesture of contact mean or not mean? So sort of, it's hard to know what the production would have been if we, I'm not saying that, you know, Orsino and I or Olivia and I would have snogged our way through the production, but I I, I do often wonder what, what it would have been like if we could have had a sort of um, more intimacy. But I think what we've created is a production directly in response to a time where touch has been impossible so actually those those moments of contact certainly from the inside feel very profound in a in a way they may not have before and actually unlike perhaps Romeo and Juliet or Midsummer, Twelfth Night is a play that even in its as you say in, in its text and even outside of a Covid situation goes out of its way to to, to resist touch and embrace yeah. so you have those two lovers the groups of lovers who more or less don't know that they're lovers yet and yeah. you have those scenes with Orsino and Viola where you know kind of laden with kind of homoerotic attraction but also evidently a sense of like but is she a boy and yeah. they're, they're yeah. Kind of quite sure if you know if, if, if they're allowed to touch or not and that funny point at the end of the play where Orsino says no I'll, you know I'll you know I'll, I'll, I'll wait till you're <laughs> into, into women's clothes and so you kind of go we're, 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 we're putting off that moment of connection yeah so it's kind of the ideal COVID times play in some Complete. ways. And even when um, when Viola and Sebastian meet, she says to him, "Do not embrace right. till each place of." Uh, you know, she, they, 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 yeah, you say, "Yeah, it's it's completely built in," and also that moment is interesting, isn't it? Sort of thinking about you know homoeroticism or the heteronormative. He does resist that as well. Like you, I, I know in our production we sort of explicitly do declare that, that Viola's gender at, at the end, but then the jacket goes back on and actually what you still you still see the, the the shadow or the silhouette of two boys going off together like it mm, is mm. yeah um you, you mentioned earlier on um thinking about speed of thought uh, referencing an earlier conversation before the recording you're being very generous I, I i was saying how amazing your speed of thought was and that's okay that goes that goes the, the for everyone in the, in the company but i'd love to hear you talk a little bit about about coming to Viola and and thinking of her as a character and kind of was this a was this a role that you'd thought about before? Had you ever played her before in any context or or, or thought about the play and about what role you might want to play in Twelfth Night? Um, never, never really thought about Viola, um, and in all honesty, it came about because. Uh, Crudely, Sean and I absolutely wanted to work together. We've been sort of working it, it sort of in departmentally for the last however many years. We did work together about 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Um, so we knew we were looking for that project. Um, and also we knew I was supposed to be in King Lear, then we had to postpone that to next season. And uh, really selfishly, maybe rightly or wrongly, it just felt like this is what I do. I, I am an actor. I'm an, I, I am a... Uh, an actor AD and and to, to to it felt important for lots of reasons to be on the front line of coming back um, after having done and, and and sort of one of the the things is never ask anyone to do something that I wouldn't do so suddenly asking all these actors to go and put themselves in close proximity to thousands of people and it felt sort of disingenuous that I go okay I'll see you from my Zoom room so there was a sort of how can we make that happen um, and I I suppose I. Sort of, I sort of felt about Viola as I did about Rosalind, if I'm honest. You know, when I think about those those great women, I think I've always known. I could feel the hook. I mean, uh, you know, with Lady M, there was a very clear hook 
not least because I was playing opposite my real life husband, but we just had the baby. So I just sort of was like, what is that? It, where does that feature in her? Um, Beatrice, again, it's like you, I understood the pain of, of unrequited love. I could find a way in. I really didn't understand Rosalind. I, I sort of really didn't understand Viola. I didn't know what these creatures were. I think I... I, I sort of felt less afraid of that with Viola because of what had happened to me when I played Rosalind. Like I, I sort of went, who is this person that like runs away to the forest and dresses as a, as a man and like, what is that? And then in the playing of it, you are possessed. And I absolutely fell in love with the, um, well, I suppose the, the speed of thought that Rosalind has, like she's in action all of the time, navigating her way. So it's her wit and her, you know, her, and her need that drives her. So suddenly getting possessed by this, she, impor she informed me rather than me going, I'm going to inform her based on my lived experience, I will inform this role. So I sort of trusted that even all my doubts and lack of sort of not really understanding Viola, something would happen in the discovery of it and in the playing of it. Um, and it it sort of, it does. I kind of have to free fall into, into some place where I go, I don't, there's lots about her that I don't understand. I just think I understand her need to survive. I understand that very quickly she she rocks up onto a, an, a place that she doesn't recognize, which I think we all understand at the moment. Like what is, like what country friends is this? Where are we living? And, but the next thing she says is, what am I gonna do? So I understand that. I understand the need to be in action and I understand the need to we have to do something. What we cut, what we don't have is the option to just sit back and let's ride this thing out. So I get that. Then the realization that her brother's drowned. And then very quickly in a half a line, she goes, but he might not be. And the captain says, no, you're right. He might not be. And then that is the motivation to stay alive, that he might, he, this person. So I think in just in those first four lines in the context of where we are now I think I understand that unbearable pull to want to see people that we might have lost during this time the hope that you will be able to see those people again is such a motivator and then the very sort of human thing that she kind of forgets about him the grief is so unbearable she meets this person that she falls in love with and then that becomes a motivator and then these occasional moments where she goes my brother but I know not and then obviously the, the obvious bit with Antonio where he names Sebastian and then and then this very quizzical act five where she's again seems to have forgotten about him but also she can't get a word in edgeways because everyone else's agenda is taken over so she does she's very much I, I think I often pay people that like that drive the scenes that have the incentive in the scenes and she really doesn't she's such a reactive um character so you're you're so dependent on what you're getting from your fellow players or what you're getting from that audience um and there is there's um i think sebastian says it, it about her that she has a mind that people envy i think that's where i sit with her like i'm so envious envious of her mind like how she navigates her way through that scene with olivia she tries one way and that doesn't work and then she tries another tactic and that doesn't work and of course as ever the thing that really cuts through is when she just speaks the truth and i mean i'm really struck to hear you frame violet around rosalind because they're such kind of central female shakespearean roles they're such central figures of kind of queer shakespeare scholarship as this sort of yeah. figure of the the effeminate boy and the kind of playfulness of kind of what the particularly the kind of the final scene looks like and with 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 Rosalind you know you get that kind of um, it's so many ways they're kind of matched you know as, yeah. as, as characters and the, and the plays emerge within the same you know couple of years of each other so there's yeah. a sort of and real sense at the beginning that yeah it will exa exactly exactly yeah. exactly there's a real sense that they're kind of that they're sort of thematically matched in in, in some way yeah. and certainly through that figure of, of Viola Rosalind, you know, yeah. as, who would presumably have been played by, by the same boy actor, you yeah, exactly, imagine, in, exactly. that, in that period. And I was watching last night and um, thinking as well about the, the way in which contemporary productions engage with gender and engage with gender performance. And I remember some years ago in 2017, I think it was, The National um, doing Twelfth Night, directed by Simon Godwin, with Tamsin Gregg playing mm -hmm. Malvolio, who was, who was regendered as Mal Malvolia. And it, it was really interesting and it, it sort of brought a kind of new 
take on, on, on the play, but the rest of the production was, was, was very conventionally cast. It, it didn't particularly um, do, anything, do anything with gender. So you had a, a, sort, of, a sort of single gender flipped figure yeah, at, at yeah. the heart of an otherwise quite conventional play. And, and, and we've got a, a Malvolio played by a, a female actor, played by Sophie Russell, wonderful, just absolutely fantastic Malvolio. And, and, and it seemed to me that that sense of Malvolio being female rang much less significantly in and of Malvolio being female. You know, it was a striking and amazing performance, but that wasn't the most striking thing about it. And that's perhaps because we have Nadine Higgin playing Belch. You know, yeah. there's, a, there's a sort of, there's a much more kind of less anxious relationship, I think, with, with, with cross-casting, with productions at the Globe now. There isn't that sort of sense of, we're doing this thing by turning this person into a, a man yes. or a woman. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it? I guess it's it's what what are you trying to make conscious? Like we haven't made conscious the fact that this is a production of eight women and four men. We haven't like, and actually, I don't think the it it that the the, the decision in the the two thousand seventeen production was to make that a conscious part of the conversation. So you come watching that play with that in mind. I think there is something much more um, uh, intersectional about the exploration in this play. That because because also if you if you, when you start to really unpick it, you've got a very heteronormative um, love relationship between Orsino, Olivia, and Viola in this production, which I think we can't ever really get away from. The production is heteronormative straight off the bat. She says, "I want to be his wife." Um, he's sort of liberated the audience from worrying about whoever's playing it because uh, in a way he said, when Orsino says you're very much like a girl, so it's not like I have to be sort of playing the thigh slapping man, he's sort of liberated me from having to play that. There's, I think he's always, he's, he's, I think in a way he's constantly trying to liberate the conversation. That's not to say that you can't read the plays through the prism of that conversation and rightly we should be having those conversations, but he will also liberate you to a different place. And I think right now, the production of Twelfth Night is how. What do you do with grief? How do you cope with loss? How do you, what what do you put in action with unrequited love? How do we love? And I think those those sorts of bigger questions become genderless. I think, um, and also I think it liberates the audience to decide whether that is something that it's a prism that they, that they want to read the play through. But it's not something. It's not been a sort of deliberately conscious. We did. Uh, quite early on, we did talk about, it was conscious in the sense that, what is this world? You know, Antonio calls it this adverse town. We know that it's dangerous. It was coming back on the back of, yet again, more conversations around Me Too, women going out after dark, what does that mean? So we had those conversations about what it is for women to be in this world. And that's a very different place for men to be in this world. And again, sort of talking about, we may not have meaning, but what, why that motivates Viola to, to, if she could have done, she would have got, gone and served Olivia. The next option is that she has to go and serve Orsino. And actually it's the safest thing to do in this world is to be a man. And a very, again, a very conscious choice to have that captain as a threatening masculine presence in this adverse town. So I think we talked about that. Um, but then very quickly the play takes over and it becomes about people in action and, and what's motivating them. Now it's interesting. One of the so again, I'm afraid this is a sort of spoiler for, in, in terms of something that happens on stage. But our first meeting of Feste in in the production is funnily enough kind of echoing what we see happen to Viola because yeah. Feste comes on dressed as a sort of voluptuous, rather Dolly Parton esque country bluegrass style singer, performs beautifully, and we see Feste reshape herself, take off her wig, her dress bind her chest mm. and dress herself as, as, a, as a sort of baseball kind of Pee Wee Herman figure. Mm. Mm. And, 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 that, and, that, and but the, the, the country singer kind of recurs at one point in, 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 in the play. So we're sort of seeing another process of potentially self-protective cross-dressing or something yeah. like that. And I that think really kind of underscores that sense, doesn't it? Exactly. And where, and drag as armor. Like yeah. we did, we sort of did some workshops in the, in the, in rehearsals where we all went and picked differently. We had to, everyone had to dress as sort of a woman. What does that mean? It was very deliberately binary, but go and dress how you, what you think female is, and then go and dress as how, what you think male is. And it was, I, I 
there was it was just a, a kind of bunch of costumes and actually I felt safest putting on the corset and the massive dress because it's very deliberately constructed like a piece of armor mm. and then to that inform the question of if you rock up on shore but it's bedraggled and it's actually no longer safe for you to be there. like what's the safest option so we did talk about costume as armor and and what is the mask that we're wearing and of course there is something about the fools in Twelfth Night where where everyone is all, sort of like you've got the obvious twin relationship with the twins but where are other people twinned you hear Viola and Marvolio almost identically say she loves me sure she loves me you've got Feste and, and Viola uh, that amazing scene between the two of them which again we don't know what it actually means but there are two people going what does it mean to be the fool and what does it mean to play the fool and that incredible speech that Viola has where He's got the wit enough to play the fool. This is a labor, like it's you, it's a job. And uh, sort of it's such a sort of amazing kind of um advert for why Shakespeare loved actors, because it is about which mask are you going to put on today in order to achieve the thing that you need to achieve. So I think it very quickly developed into that kind of conversation. Uh, and I, I saw yeah. I saw a twinning as well, which I've never seen before in this play between Feste and Malvolio. Yeah, right. Which, which was uh, partly a partly an aspect of casting, partly an aspect of performance, but actually I was seeing, I was really seeing the, the, the kind of structural twinning of those characters as well. Yes. Which was, was a surprise to me. I haven't, I haven't thought about those characters as linked before. And that, well, you suddenly realise where it's a play also, a, a play about performance, so the performative nature of gender, the performative nature of an age or, or whatever it is, but also the ability to perform somebody else. So the, the reason it can happen is because Feste is so brilliant at imitating Sir Topaz or brilliant at imitating Malvolio or and again in that brilliant speech where he says um he must observe their mood on whom he jests the quality of person and the time like it's such a skill to really see someone and I think that's what you get with Feste who's constantly observing and 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 probably similarly with Viola adapting to every single person that they meet and so it's yeah absolutely what the, the relationship between Feste and Marvoli which is then used sometimes that's used for good sometimes that's used for bad um but yes so yeah. there's a, I suppose there's another twin um energy going on in the play uh which is Viola and Olivia and and, and that's that's there in the names you know there's interesting kind of almost an a, 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 what, what's the acronym, acronymized names, almost <laughs> yeah. not quite, yeah. Olivia Viola. And I saw in the production last night, um, in the your first meeting in At One Scene Five, where you come on, I, I saw a look that, that Viola gives Olivia, who I think at this stage is still masked, is still veiled, which was very redolent. And also in the, in the jig at the end of the play, there's a wonderful moment between Violet and Olivia while the rest of the company are jigging and I saw something some kind of thread or wire from that moment to the to the end which I suppose raised questions in my mind about the validity and the kind of like the health of Violet and Orsino and the kind of, you know, and, the, and, 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 and 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 indeed Olivia and Sebastian and so I I wondered if you'd thought about kind of the afterlives of these characters in in your head do you think actually something else might might happen other than the rather heteronormative relationships we see at the end of the play yeah always I mean we can't get away from the fact that he has he has sort of uh, not visually coupled them up because as we say we still see these two boys go off together and we also can't pretend that Orsino Orsino fell in love with Cesario not Viola so there's always that question I remember doing when we did um, As You Like It and he couples all of them at the end but there's never a moment of union between Rosalind and Orlando and we we didn't have that moment and we resisted it and resisted it and resisted it and eventually I remember Blanche coming and saying look you're just gonna have to kiss because the audience want it because he didn't write it so he I think he's always playing with the gaps between and what could happen and what might have happened and there's something again not to it's I hope it's not an imposition. I think, or I hope it's been fed by the play that if you just, even if you just look at stage time, he gives more stage time to that relationship than, than he does to Viola and Orsino. Just very crudely, he's more interested in what is going on between these two people and how they meet uh, through grief. I think there's a moment where, you know, Viola comes in as Cesario and is doing her job. And then she sees her sister in grief. Like she understands that and she says, 
So it's, it's very feminized to say to someone, tell me your mind. That's such a feminine response to somebody. So I think where they meet um, through grief, where they meet through attraction, um, and where they meet through intrigue as well, there is something that you know, Viola is intrigued by this person that Orsino is so in love with, like who is, what is he in love with and who is this person that he would seemingly do anything for? So I think there, there is a, they are bound to each other. And I, I think they will be bound to each other in life beyond the play. And I think that's definitely what we tried to, in, in the jig to not, not pretend that that didn't happen because there is a fascination, a love, an intrigue, a complicity and understanding and allyship. And they say sister, like I think sister in its sort of biggest sense of the word, I think they will be sistered forever because of, of what they go through. Sisters and twins, this play is twinned with Midsummer Night's Dream, which are, which are not in, but yeah. the company all have been. How has that kind of made itself known in, in the room? It's obviously you've been in rep before, you've worked on, on, on plays at the same time before, so you have an experience of, of how those those plays might overlap kind of thematically or emotionally yeah. for, for the companies. What What's that experience been like for, for your colleagues in the company and, and for you having Twelfth Night, in, having Midsummer in your mind while also working with the people who are... Who were uh, who were responsible for that play and for and for Twelfth Night? Yeah, what was amazing about rehearsals was hearing them like uh, like without fail in every scene go. That's in Midsummer Night's Dream. Someone says that in Midsummer. Who says that in Midsummer Night's Dream? So you can you could feel them sort of twinning the plays. Um, I think oddly there was a sort of counter to the as you say Midsummer Night's Dream is an unbelievably dynamic and. Uh, very consciously and ostentatiously um, out. It's not an introspective production. And I think what you could feel both from Sean and the, the company was we've got that, now how do we do this? So there was a much more, um, uh, um, much more psychologically motivated conversation about who are these people, what motivates them? And I think that you've identified with Feste, with Malvolio, with, with Belch, often those characters that you can, you can of course, play all of these in a myriad of ways, but, but what is it that is, why do they do what they do? So I think there was a, a definite pull to investigate something, a, a different tone to the production. So that's, I think I'm lucky in that, 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 that I'm not sort of trying to fit into a, an atmosphere that bleeds into both plays, that when we do Twelfth Night, we're very consciously stepping into a very different world. So there's no sort of attempt to twin them to, in terms of production or atmosphere. Um, I suppose, I think I'm just endlessly struck by how much he, he believes in the power of our imagination. And I think I've sort of clung that onto that during this time that if we can still dream, we can still hope, if we can still imagine, reimagine, rewild, readapt, da, 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 we can we can find a way through, through it. Um, so the individual imagination of the characters, but also just thinking about that amazing speech and dream about you, know, we give to airy habitation, uh, to airy nothing, a, a local habitation and a name, thinking about Viola saying, prove true imagination, prove true that I think there's, just moment there's for me that's the the bit that it, it certainly wasn't conscious when we were programming it but just in a way that imagination doesn't quite come into Romeo and Juliet I think if imagination could have come into Romeo and Juliet they may have found an alternative to the devastation and the the, the end but there's something about where imagination can take you not not necessarily always to a hopeful place like I think you know, imagination takes Malvolio to the dungeon into somewhere incredibly painful because of the imagination of other other people but watching imagination at play in these two very different worlds there's something very concrete about Twelfth Night in a way that you know you I think I felt the absence of the gods in Twelfth Night in a way that I felt when I remember playing Dream and you definitely get from Sean's Dream it's so vertical um, the characters in Twelfth Night have to work really hard to believe that there's something above them and something that's holding them. And we talk about the fates and we talk about pray God defend me, but it's sort of it's not it's not glib, but it's sort of hopeful that they're there. Whereas you see the gods on stage in Midsummer Night's Dream. So I think there's something that I definitely feel the absence of the mythic in Twelfth Night in a in a way that I think we feel in our world at the moment in this very secularized secularized world 
um, ritualist world how do we get back to the ritual which I think again is part of the ritual of going to theatre whatever is going on on the stage something about returning to a ritual that is comforting for this time so I think I've just said you to you what what is probably not similar rather than what is similar but um which is even better as an answer I'm um, sure one of the things you do so well is is find those paths between plays and between characters and, and particularly in terms of sort of seasons you know you can find a, a kind of emotional and, and, and sort of co imaginative coherent path through those through those plays and we've had that this year with Midsummer and with Romeo and Juliet and, and, and Twelfth Night and our tour plays and, and, and now leading into Metamorphosis and I, I, I suppose I'm curious to think about the way because simply because Twelfth Night was the last of our summer shows to open um, sort of thinking about it hooking into that kind of autumn and, uh, and, and winter season yeah you've described so beautifully how it kind of is a sort of kick is a sort of jump start for the imagination where where do you see it kind of hooking onto or linking with our production of metamorphosis potentially measure for measure yeah hamlet merchant yeah. of venice are those com are there conversations that might sweep us into winter 22 yeah i think there are I, th I think metamorphosis is so sort of uh it, it was cut it was you know we programmed it for 2019 to sit alongside that ensemble and it felt necessary and relevant then but i think you know meta the, the production itself has metamorphosed you know metamorphosing by name and nature and also where we are like we are constantly in a state of metamorphosing transforming the power of transformation why we transform I think there's something that leads us um we know the production will uh it will be rock and roll it, it will be Sean and Holly and the, those amazing writers taking a rock and roll approach to these these tales but the tales don't shy away from some of the huge moral um and ethical questions of our time in a way that I think Romeo and Juliet does very specifically through a very particular prism of how we approach a very particular question um but Midsummer Night's Dream and Twelfth Night are very deliberately questioning plays that don't provide answers, that don't sit down at somewhere morally, ethically. You don't quite know. Um, you're sort of free as, a, as an audience member. Um, and that's true of that space out there as well. I think that it's deliberately distracted, deliberately um, diverse in, in, in all its meanings. But it's less so in the SWP, in that, in, in that um, candlelit playhouse. It, it is a smaller prison through which to, to read these plays. So it's very deliberate that we transition from, whilst it might still have the feel of something epic because these are of its myths, what they are veering us towards is how do we sit with these moral and ethical questions without judgment? I don't think he provides answers in Measure for Measure or Hamlet or uh, Merchant, but he does provide a forum with which we can sit and bear witness to some of these moral and ethical questions and have time to discuss them with nuance. I think that's the crucial bit for me at this time. It's not about saying this is the answer to me too, or this is about the answer to race or anti-Semitism, but just having time and space to sit with these ethical questions. And again, really leaning into the, the, the tragedy of it, because whether we like it or not, when we go into an interior space, you go into a psychological space. These are going to be tragic productions, but tragedy, again, going back to what tragedy is in the truest sense of the word, is watching people in action, watching people have fate, hand them a deck of cards, but still have to individually choose how they play them. And I think that is where we all are now. We've all been handed, whether it's nationally, internationally, climate-wise, we've been handed a deck of cards and we have to ask nuanced questions about how we're going to play them now. So yes, deliberately and conscious move into that. <laughs> I can't, I can't wait. I really can't. Um, Michelle, thank you so much. I, we, I, as you know, I could sit on this Zoom call and talk to you all day and I wish I could. Um, thank you very much for uh, sharing that with us. And I cannot wait to see both Meta and indeed the winter, the winter season. Um, thank you very much uh, for watching. I hope you enjoyed Behind Closed Doors Twelfth Night uh, with the amazing and wonderful Michelle Terry. <laughs>